Geek Myths, a novel about life, love, and the pursuit of sonic screwdrivers. Available in paperback and Kindle edition from Amazon. Scanning for audio. Welcome once again to another Tin Dog Podcast and the second part of our 20 for 20 hound sight, yes I know, range. Last time, God knows when you heard that, episode one, we discussed the release from 1999, the first part of the new main range. Oh, and can I just say at this point, yes, you're not hearing things, I have got a bad voice. My throat is hurting. There's nothing we can really do about that. But today is my birthday. And as such, it's also the birthday of the Tin Dog podcast. It's been going for more care, more years than I really should go mention. I think this is either its 12th or 13th birthday. Well, let's put it this way. When the first episode came out, I was in my mid-30s. And now I'm rapidly heading towards 50. Not good. But I've spent the day at work and I want to spend it with you. Oh, beloved and probably attractive listener. Chatting about old Doctor Who. I didn't think you'd mind. Now, let's skip back and have a quick listen to what exactly we've missed in our last 10 releases. 10, not 12. Although this is a full year later, there were only 10 releases that year. The plan, of course, was to build up to a full one month release ratio, but that just didn't happen. So from 1999 all the way up to this review in 2000, we had, of course, The Sirens of Time, then Phantasmagoria, that's the really nice one with Mark Gatiss. Well, written by. That was a Turlo story. Nicely done, Fifth Doctor. Whispers of Terror. Again, Sixth Doctor story. Set in the library, I believe. Making use of that whole audio thing. Still finding their feet, definitely. Land of the Dead by Gary Russell. That's a Fifth Doctor and Nyssa story. That was the really weird one with lots of weird seal creatures. The Fearmonger, that's the one with Jacqueline Pierce and the far right-wing rise. I mean, who could imagine a far right-wing rise in UK? And then we arrived at the Marian Conspiracy, which was, at some point in the future, going to be my very first big finish purchase. That's on tape. I'll discuss that in a minute. That was followed by the Genocide Machine, the first Dalek story, Red Dawn, Ice Warriors a go go, and then the Spectre of Lanyon Moor, where everyone gets to see the word Fugu. Ah. And that brings us up to release number 10 Winter for the Adept. Now, obviously, they're finding their feet. They're a lot more adept with these storylines. By the time we've reached the year 2000, I'm not going to bother telling you what was in the charts or what was popular on TV or anything like that. I do need to say that Buffy was big. I'm pretty sure that Angel was still on TV. But this is not going to turn into the rock and roll years. The important bit for us to remember is that we're still in the wilderness years. We've gone through the millennium and we've ended up rather to my surprise, still alive. You see, at the time, my plan was to get into quite a lot of debt. And then, when the Millennium Bug hit and all of the missiles started flying, um, it really wouldn't matter. Bizarrely, 20 years later, 
I've discovered that we didn't all die in a Terminator-style apocalypse, and that any of my financial woes at the time just kind of needed to be sorted out. But that was 20 years ago. That was the millennium. Where did you spend the millennium? I believe I was under the Tyne Bridge in Newcastle. Very, very cold, waiting for some fireworks and managing to miss people that we'd arranged to meet. Standing reasonably close to other people and everyone, I seem to remember, was inappropriately dressed. But that's Newcastle for you. Everyone will always be inappropriately dressed. As I've said so many times in the past, they asked me at the border of Newcastle if I owned a coat. I said yes. They asked me if I was a heavy drinker. I said no. They said, here, sir, is your passport. You may leave and move south. The deep south. Yorkshire. Yeah, it's funny the first time you hear it, but not after you've heard it 200 times. We're in the wilderness years. Doctor Who is definitely, definitely, definitely not coming back onto TV. The internet's kicking off slightly more. Places like Gallifrey Base are great. Places like Gallifrey, the convention, well, they're not as big as they would once become, but they are still the sort of thing that gets whispered about, dreamed about. Inventions like iPads and iPods are still a few years off. I believe. If you want to be part of fandom, the internet might be the place to be, but it's still basically the realm of Doctor Who magazine. You would have to go into HMV or Dylan's The Bookstore, or a host of others to track down your exciting Doctor Who paraphernalia. This is just a few years ago. Blink and you miss it and this is the past. But it feels so like it was just five minutes ago to me. It's incredible that so much has changed in such a short time. But as someone pointed out, we're as far as far away now from Silver Nemesis as Silver Nemesis was from an unearthly child. That made me feel so tremendously old. So, this is the world that we're in. I've described it in great depth and great detail, and yet I've hardly scratched the surface. It feels very much like now. We had mobile phones. They weren't smartphones, but we could text, we could chat, we could look things up on a small basis. There was about to be a quantum leap in information, but it wasn't quite there yet. I don't know the precise dates of the invention of the MP3, or when the iPod was invented, or even when podcasting came about, but it was literally round the corner. So, it's 2000, and we've already had the release of the Marian Conspiracy, which was, as I've said, destined to be my first ever Big Finish release. So right now I'm about to talk about a story that I didn't hear for years. Now, my best friend Andy, Mr. Andrew Richard Barber has been dead for about a decade. He was the best man at my wedding. I loved him with all of my heart and he's no longer with us. He got leukaemia, he had chemo, which destroyed in turn his ability to fight anything. And he became ill and better and ill and better. The leukaemia went away. His immune system was also shot to hell. And one day I got a text saying I'm in hospital and I couldn't quite make it to see him. A couple of days later, I get a text saying, well, he's died. Not even a text, a phone call. From the man who would one day have been his husband if Andy had lived. Andy and I met through a mutual love of role-playing games and Red Dwarf. It got to a point where we wouldn't be able to play games together in the same group because we would just spend the whole time laughing. My overriding memory of this man is one of laughter. He was the person with a disposable income. 
what he described himself as access to the pink pound. And he also described the people in charge of Big Finish as Doctor Who's gay mafia. He had opinions that were very firmly in the early noughties. And, as he's no longer with us, they never get to evolve or move on, and that's something I miss. I miss chatting with him about the series, and I would have loved to have known of what he would have thought these days. The reason that I bring him up at this point is that he was the person who was buying these CDs. He was the person who one day, and I'm putting my cards on the table here and being honest, allow me to borrow his discs and listen to them myself. Yes, I know one day I'd come around and I'd end up buying them and paying for them, but I was not familiar with them. And that was how I first heard ever these stories, through discs that had been lent to me by Andrew Barber. So it's been quite a while since I've heard these. Yes, I've done the odd re-listen time and time again, but I've never really paid attention. I've never had to do it for a podcast. So, enough background. Let's dive in to a story that, from memory, is the one with the woman out of MasterChef, the one that takes place in a bit of a haunted chalet somewhere. I remember it feeling very cold. There's a lot of wind sound effects, and that's about it. There's probably a ghost on it. There's something blue and squishy on the front of the cover. And I've looked this up. If you want to buy it, like most of the stuff I'll be reviewing here, it's £2.99. Which, given the current exchange rate and the state of the British economy, is practically nothing. So, I then go away and listen to it, and I get to experience this story almost afresh. Tell you what, before I discuss it anymore, here's the trailer. Doctor Who, Winter for the Adept. I well remember that winter as long as the embers of memory still glow feebly in my mind. That haunted winter night when I met the man who calls himself the Doctor. Good evening. An agent of Satan. Yes, basically, Miss Tremaine is an eccentric Scots spinster with a religious fixation. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. But she had the inspiration to set up an expensive finishing school for young ladies, tucked away snugly in a chateau high in the breathtaking Swiss Alps. What an odd place for a school. It's an odd school, but we are fortunate to reach it in time. There's a bad mountain storm coming, and soon the visibility will drop to nothing. I shall fear no evil. Perhaps I can help. I doubt it. It's a very particular problem. Yes, definitely the beginning of a poltergeist manifestation. Excellent. What's that? Spirits of the dead. Is this some kind of joke? I don't believe in ghosts. (laughs) Extraordinary. Did you see that? Yes. I think we should get back to Peril and Alison, Doctor. Shifted the piano across the room as if it was a toy. Ever since I was small, I could move things just by thinking about them. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. What are you going to do? Punish me? The time has come for purification. This is more complex than I imagined, and much more dangerous. This blade is merely an instrument, just as I am merely an instrument of the Lord's wrath. So... The one thing that I also remembered originally from this, memory not cheating half as much as I thought it was going to, was that it's got the bloke from Babylon 5 in it. Yeah, Babylon 5. There's something from those rock and roll, yeah, flashbacks. I mean, let's face it, Babylon 5 was huge. Somebody once asked me what religion I was. Everyone was going, no, you're going to put Jedi. (laughs) No, I'm going to put lapsed Time Lord. Because that's what I was. I was always deep down a Doctor Who fan. But we had to fill these years with something. And Babylon 5 was for me. I didn't really like Voyager at the time. Voyager is best when you watch it one episode every day straight through. You get that whole soap opera recurring thing. Almost binge-watchy thing about it. Yeah? 
but Babylon 5, that was appointment viewing. I remember in the year 2000, I think it was the year 2000, it was around that time, being in Manchester, living there, and one of my mates had visited, and I think it was the last ever episode of Babylon 5, and we watched it on this tiny little scratchy portable, because we'd had series 1 to 4, and then they ended it early, because the storyline was meant to last five seasons, and then the idiots went, yeah, let's have another year. They had to get new actors in and all sorts. Season five's very strange. I'd love to be able to sit down and stretch season five and season four and squish them together to make them lovely. Babylon 5 was brilliant. The cast was superb, many of which are no longer with us anymore. The curse of Babylon 5 is notoriously famous. Peter Jurassic played Londo Malari. I adored Londo. I looked glorious in purple. Ah. The guy practically sounded like the Count from Sesame Street. And Big Finish liked to get people in who were going to bring in everyone else. I mean, you'd had Jacqueline Pierce to bring in the Doctor Who and Blake Seven fans. She'd been great in her story. There's always been sort of guest stars a go-go. I'd like Maggie Stables had been in the earlier story. In this story, you get to hear, well, one of our favourites. Charlotte Pollard. She's not going to appear here. The actress who plays Charlotte Pollard, however, is here. Now, in the UK, Charlotte Pollard's actress and... Oh, right. Okay. Can I just say, right now I'm driving. I can't look at my notes. I cannot remember her name. I'm beating myself up something rotten. I want to hurt myself because I can't remember her name. Because I love her. Right? I've, I've loved Charlie. Right? And... Uh, oh, my God. I know you're shouting it back at me, but I can't hear you, can I? Right. She's in it. No, she is. And I can't remember her name. And I know I will in a minute, but that's fine. But there is something brilliant about listening to this story and hearing the lines, I never cook myself, I'm a terrible cook, if you do something bad enough, somebody else will do it for you. From the voice of MasterChef. It's it's beautiful. It truly is. Story, however, well, it's been written by the person who brought us Ghostlight. Andrew Cartmel. You know, the, the Cartmel master plan kind of thing. Bit confusing, bit Doctor Who. India Fisher! Aha! And you would come back to me? India Fisher, right. So, Andrew Cartmel is notorious for your convoluted Doctor Who stories. So obviously, what they're going to do is, they're not going to give him a seventh Doctor story to write. Oh no, they're going to give him a fifth Doctor story to present and give to us. Dead useful, dead brilliant, right? So, we've got our fifth Doctor story. We've got the fifth Doctor and just Nyssa. In these early years, what we were going to get was one Doctor, one companion, done. So they had to find the gaps in the big finishness. Well, in the TV Doctor Who to fit them in. These days, it's not important. We largely don't care. We're pleased when they bring back the um, chameleon and all of that business. But to be fair, we're just grateful. We love it when they mix and match companions. But back then, we were all kind of, yes, this one fits firmly in this gap here where Tegan had left the TARDIS and before Turlough had turned up and when Adric was clearly dead and would never come back. That's what we were like. It mattered to us so much where they fitted in on TV. But remember now, there's more audio Doctor Who than TV Doctor Who. TV Doctor Who's secondary, especially to me, because I love the big finish stuff so much. TV Doctor Who's just kind of on. It's to help fill the gaps and make it more confusing. I liked the Moffat era mainly because it was employed in the same sort of gap-filling and mystery-making that I loved from Big Finish. That end of things is taking a back seat, and rightly so, for modern Doctor Who. Right here, right now, in this story, though it's the year 2000, we've still got the Tom Baker theme tune. We've got reduced stings at the end of the episode. They're learning their trade quite well. And it's a great story. I've got issues with it. Of course I have. 
you've got a ghost story which is basically oh there's a ghost now in Doctor Who you've got to have a scientific reason behind ghosts you've also got aliens with a stupid name the spillagers half spilling into somewhere half pillagers it's not good I don't like them they should have had a better name they should have had a name for themselves or even corrected the doctor and saying why are you calling us that we're actually called the the, the Vitrari or something I don't know I don't even know where that name came, came from that's fine so you've got an underlying alien threat you've got the uh, mystery over a very small cast over who actually is in charge of uh, the events that's going on you've got a spurious dodgy woman running the chalet yes it's a ghost story but everything's really white everything's very cold Nissa stood in the snow uh, she can ski but she can't Peter Jurassic is playing when I'm listening because yeah you know people can play on audio any age let's face it Sophie Aldred's slightly older than me but she's playing 16 on audio and we perfectly let that slide and you were willing to let Peter Jurassic's character someone who'd be in his 50s let's call it that playing somebody younger I mean it's audio so I'm thinking yeah he's in his 20s ish we'll do that and he's having a relationship with a te- with a, one of the students but then there's a line going you're old enough to be her father and if they'd got rid of that line then it would have been more acceptable but it's not it's still there little moments stuff that you wouldn't actually expect or accept in a more up to date release have these stories become of their time I don't know perhaps they have I don't mind that at all. I mean, they are examples, perfectly good and perfectly reasonable examples of things of their time. Oh, uh, is it a good story? Yes. It's not the best story in the world. I would probably have gone for the Jacqueline Pierce release if I was going to recommend one from this year. But that's only because I'm going from things that are in my mind. It's not that I've gone back and listened to them all. God help me, if I'd gone back and listened to them all, I really would have shared that with you, but I can't. I've got some other things on. I should be finishing a short story that I've promised to Steve. I should be working on a short story that I've promised to Steve Hatcher. And as for Jane of the Air, Volume 2, well, least said, soonest mended on that one. Nobody wants to buy Volume 1. I really should be considering cutting my losses. Anyway, apart from that, and the fact that you end up in quite a convoluted scenario, cracking story, of course I've got out my gripes. My main gripe is the beginning and the end. It suffers from, how can I put this, Radio 4's disease, where you've got narrative. You've got someone flicking through the old pages of their diary, a bit of a flashback thing going on flashbacks in Doctor Who somebody describing it and setting the scene book ending that's the words I was looking for there's no need for that it's show don't tell Mm, I know luckily we don't get it very often at least that's what I thought but then I heard this then I heard Missy episode one of Missy is book ended in exactly the same way so perhaps we still don't get this in Doctor Who but we still get it in Big Finish because it is well the audio medium and it's a tried and tested way of telling us stories yes I genuinely appreciate this story I love the fact that they were hiring people from Babylon 5 that made me very happy it's a shame you couldn't get Stephen Verst at some point but you can't have everything or perhaps they did and I just didn't spot it I love this story, yes. Have I gone back and listened to it lots of times? No. But I'll tell you what, it's definitely worth shelling out cash, especially if you're listening to modern new Big Finish, because it's just as good, and it doesn't cost you 15 quid. It costs you three. So yes, it's a base under siege. It's got a fairly basic story arc, but there's a very nice spiritual side of things and you know what as the person who wrote Blue Box Messiah it's nice to have a bit of 
ghostiness, a bit of religious nuttery going on. It makes me happy. So, I'll say farewell and let you decide for yourself whether you want to listen to it or not. And then next time, I mean next time in this range, we'll be discussing Blood Tide with Maggie Stables yay, and Colin yay, because we love the Sixth Doctor. Let's face it, it's an adventure with the Silurians, the Sixth Doctor, some pirates and Darwin. What's not to like? So until next time, be seeing you. That was the Doctor Who Tin Dog Podcast, available on iTunes, YouTube, Twitter, RSS, Vimeo, and across the internet. Doctor Who and its associated properties are all copyright and trademark of the BBC. No infringement is intended. Why not become a supporter by visiting patreon.com slash tin dog. Contact the show on tin-dog at hotmail.co.uk. The Tin Dog Podcast is a founder member of the Doctor Who Podcast Alliance.